So, um, anyways, the best I can do is the uh, valves, which are not great. Okay. All right, everybody finished? No. Well, you got 20 seconds, so you better hurry up. <laughs> Oh good, I'll have those I have those answers in case those that did the last page want to know what they are. Alright? You don't have to, but if you did. Alright, I have them for you in case you're wondering. Alright, um and I do have Kim on the list. Is there anyone uh, that came in a little bit late that did not get their name put on the sign in sheet? Got you. Alright. Uh, Mayo. <coughs> oh yeah, okay. Okay, Mayo, stop double dipping. Um, and uh, anybody else? I have her already. Anybody else? Okay. All right, real quickly, let's go over these. Um, so we can get back to the notes and then get our uh, our practice test ga uh, game on. All right. All right. Um, number one. Number one, uh, and as always, uh, the first uh, the first eight questions um, are actually released AP exam questions. Uh, the rest have been constructed by teachers. Uh, so while I don't think you should necessarily, I give more value to the ones that are actually released, right? Um, and so those first eight, what? I know this. Yeah, I didn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. So some of them are uh, are done uh, by teachers doing their best uh, to kind of try to emulate the questions. What's that? Yeah. All right, number one. Uh, number one is uh, D. All right, it's passage of the Missouri Compromise. All right. Question is, hey, which of those answers would have best maintained the balance between North and South? Well, obviously, that's what the compromises were designed to do, right? To preserve a balance um, between the two regions. Two, which of the following historical developments during the 19th century Best supports Potter's argument about the underlying cause of sectional conflict. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, the answer we were looking for there was B as in boy. Because there was more economic opportunity out west, more people went out west, which suddenly meant we have to resolve now what are these western states going to be, free or slave. All right, so because there was so much movement out west, it intensified the debate over slavery. Uh, three. The acquisition of a new empire referenced in the excerpt most directly fostered sectional division through the B, renewed debate over the expansion of slavery. Those two answers were very similar to one another. They were very much linked together. I would argue so is this one. All right, number four. Which of the following most directly contributed to the decision by the U.S. to fight the Mexican-American War? A, the idea of manifest destiny. Right? Let's go to... Well, let's go to 5 to 7, which I have labeled as 26 to 28 up on the top there, but just ignore that. Um, right there. Uh, number 5, which of the following provides the best evidence in support of the argument in the excerpt? Now, hey, what Kenneth Stamp is saying there is, hey, reconstruction governments in the South weren't great, but they were better than any government that had existed up to that point in the South. All right, They were actually the most democratic governments the South had ever seen. Um, even if clearly uh, they were not as democratic as they should have been. All right, so uh, this is a really nuanced question, uh, series of questions. Five, which of the following provides the best evidence in support of the arguments in the excerpt? D, changes in voting patterns and office holding that occurred during Reconstruction. Remember, while the troops were there, right, um, Southerners are able to vote. Southerners start to win elections. We have our first African-American senators and congressmen. As soon as the troops leave, right, all that goes away. All right. Number six, which of the following later historical developments is most similar to the actions of the government described in the excerpt? D, the desegregation of the United States military in 1940. Very good. Oh, number seven makes it a heck of a lot easier for you if you know what the word waning means, right? Which means decreasing, right? Um, number seven, which of the following contributed most directly to the end of Reconstruction? It would be B, the waning commitment to reform in the North. What, yeah, yeah, all that means is, hey, we focused on this without enough results. Let's move over to economic matters, right, instead. We see this a lot with the American public. They're, they're, they're interested in supporting reforms to a certain point, you know? 
No. Right. Very much so. Oh, uh, number eight, nine, and ten, I will just tell you right now, that's a passage that is much longer than you would ever see on an AP exam. All right, that was a freaking mini book right there, right? It's like a novella. Um, anyways, number eight, during the and after the Civil War, movements of people like the ones described here were D, incentivized by the federal government. Yes. Homestead Act, right? Yes. The government's going to pass policies to actually encourage people to move west. Um, and that's uh, the Homestead Act that we're talking about. Number nine. <laughs> the passage implies that long journeys of migration to unsettled lands, the presence of many women and children, that is not worded well. Uh, B? It, because they lived? It actually sp says that. It implied, alrighty, would actually be D, was not very common. Alrighty. <laughs> Yeah. Our caravan had a good many women and children, and although we were probably longer owing to the journey, oh, to the journey owing to their presence, they exerted a good influence. So I think what the implication there is um, is that they are a somewhat unique caravan because. So then I read the, I read the rest of the paragraph, and then I know. <laughs> <laughs> this song makes me laugh because I I I liked I didn't love D as I liked B too. Uh, can I point out one thing uh, because I did contact the question person here on this. Um, I did. Yeah. Um, their answer was that the successful journey is an explicit statement in the passage. Uh, the implication, the implied message there would be D, and the question is asking for the implied message. Should have been like, what's your pass rate? <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, if you put B, we'll give you the credit for that. Yeah. All right. Good Lord. Lord. <laughs> Number 10, compared to the views of previous white settlers, what that had, right? Hans' ideas about Indians. A, we're similar. All right, A, we're similar. All right, A. Apparently, we decided, you know, prepositions are, are so uh, are so optional. All right. Um, anyway, anyways, these are better. Eleven, Henry Clay condemned. Shh. Eleven is D. All right. He condemned the Whigs in Congress for failing to oppose the war with Mexico. Twelve, Clay speech for shh. Clay speech foreshadows the congressional debate over a the status of slavery in the Mexican session. All right. Thirteen, Henry Clay believed the War of 1812 was a just war because the motives for that war contrast with the motives for the Mexican War, in that a the United States was defending its own economic interests in the War of 1812. Number fourteen. Many who opposed the war with Mexico did so because, C, they believed the motivations for starting the war uh, were not to protect the interests of the United States, but to obtain new land. Fifteen! They're really foreshadowed. I see it all the time. Yeah, foreshadow, you know, that's, you know, that's a... That's not just an English sort of thing, all right? You see a lot of foreshadowing in, in history. All right, I'm sorry. 615. Uh, the purpose of the cartoon is to show that B, Reconstruction, was not protecting the civil rights of former slaves. 16. B. 16. What actions by southern states most led to the conditions represented in the cartoon? A, the imposition of repro laws. <laughs> 17. What acts of Congress were intended to prevent uh, Southern states' efforts? Uh, 17. B. All right. Constitutional amendment regarding civil rights and suffrage. If the goal of the South was Jim Crow, according to number 16, Right, then, then, then federal efforts, national efforts would have been to stop the Jim Crow laws, right, so to bring civil rights and suffrage. 18. Shh. 18. Many of the conditions applied in the cartoon resolved during the C civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. 
All right. 19, you need to understand that this is a message coming from freed men, which would have been former slaves, um, now that have recently been freed. Uh, they're obviously sending this to President Johnson to try to get him to support their cause. 19, the freedmen of Edisto Island wrote this letter to Andrew Johnson to... D, request the opportunity to purchase land. All right, it actually said that in the uh, passage. Um, I hear you. All right, yeah, I do hear you there. All right. 19, we're going to go with the... Don't feel too bad if you did put C. All right. 20, in the Reconstruction Era, President Andrew Johnson... B, allowed former Confederates to reassert control over state governments. That's what causes the conflict between Johnson and Congress, right? That ultimately results in him being impeached, right? What's up? Yeah, he was impeached. He was almost removed. Remember, impeached just means you're put on trial, all righty? So he was impeached. He was within one vote of being removed. Number 21, under the circumstances described in the passage above, Southern agriculture throughout the Reconstruction years saw D, a subsistence style of agriculture in which freedmen worked on land they could not own. <laughs> 22, I mean, I, I hope you got this one. If you missed 22, wow. Uh, I don't know what you were seeing in that. Uh, 22, the poster is directed towards B, free and escape, free and escape blacks as a warning. 23, the existence of this poster provides evidence that B, abolitionists worried the new Fugitive Slave Act would allow slave countries to spread into the dark. 24, shh. After the Compromise of 1850, why did the political atmosphere remain tense? D, the slavery issue had not been adequately resolved to prevent future conflict, right? That's why we have a war 10 years later, right? 25, the failure of the new Fugitive Slave Law to resolve the issue of slavery, good question, A, was exacerbated by a future Supreme Court decision that slaves were, pro were property. What decision was that? Dred Scott, right? That was a Dred Scott decision. All right. 26, this, of course, is the, uh, the order of secession by South Carolina, the first to secede, right? Uh, 26, in South Carolina's order of secession, what is the explicit claim... I know you guys hate it when you when we ask the implicit explicit questions. The explicit claim is C slavery is a constitutional right. Twenty seven, South Carolina's response to the eighteen sixty election. B was based on the unresolved constitutional issue of nullification and states' rights. All right. Alright. <laughs> Forrest, I'm not sure we can make it an A cup. Just because there's no question of representation, right? Uh, 28. The concerns raised by the leaders of South Carolina in this passage. C had been debated by politicians for several decades, resulting in a series of compromises. Hey! Anybody that did 293031, CCC for 293031. All right, we're putting people, we're putting people back to work. Right? Yes, we are with the CCC. Check your results, please. Check your results. No, you do not. All righty. <laughs> Anybody with a 23 or higher? Any 23s or higher? Oh, right. Wait, how much is it? Oh, that's great. Hey, can I be honest with you? <laughs> Technically, a 22 would still be a five as well. I just, I just like to err a little bit more on the, on the conservative side when it comes to scoring. Uh, to not give false senses of security. All right. <laughs> Five minute break, five minutes. 
coming on back in five at 9:25. Where we begin, where we, we're restarting again. <laughs> practicing calculus on his own. Yeah. Yes, I had many of my seniors, did I tell you, come and complain to me? Did Gabriel tell you what they said to me? They're like, we're not like Forrest and Gabriel where all this stuff just comes automatically to them. And I'm like, I doubt it comes automatically. I'm sure they're working hard. All right? 
Yeah. Always nice when they undermine your guys' efforts and abilities, right? Yeah, the whole talent thing, national talent. No, I Or if you're like, Steve, he says, oh, she's Asian, it's in your book. Um, I understood you telling me that yesterday about somebody. Nah, but she's Asian, so she's probably doing better than me. I am. I am. I am? Mm -hmm. In what? Calculus. I'm failing calculus. That's what I told her. I'm like, I know, Nan told me she's failing. All right. They were upset because they did all this work and all this stuff, and, and I guess some of their grades went down or something. Wait, honestly, 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 honestly. Hold on one second, Kyle. That's what I feel like, dude. Yeah. I'm with ya. <laughs> yes, ma'am. On Friday, there's a review session. Up, upcoming Friday? Yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, I stay here till 4. That's fine. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what time you Sometime better than none. Alrighty, I'd rather have you here for as much as you can be. Okay? And do we have one on Friday? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's a crazy week next week. My goodness. All right, hey folks, let's get back at it. All right, with the white vans. All right. All right. So. Forces industrialization and the Gilded Age. Um, and you probably recognize. Um, the years. Um, the years uh, 1865, which of course uh, is the end of the Civil War, um, all the way to 1898, which is the start of Imperial. I know that's. Shut up. Alrighty, that's 1898. Um, anyways. Please notice there is some overlap with these units, right? Obviously, Unit 5 goes all the way through Reconstruction, um, so the focus there is all slavery and Reconstruction, all right? Then we go back, and it's like, why are we jumping back those 12 years again? Because remember, we're, we're, we're looking at something different now. We're looking at, okay, at the same time that Reconstruction was going on, what about all the industrialization gilded age that occurs too, all right? Uh, please note, we only have nine units. Um, and so we're already going to be kind of getting our way through Unit 6 today. Unit 7 and Unit 8 are large, right? And so I think I actually divide those reviews up into halves. 
Um, and I probably actually won't get through all of these reviews today before the mock exam. Yeah. Exactly right, right? And, uh, uh, obviously, Reconstruction's main area of focus is in the southern states. Industrialization is more of a national movement. Obviously, it has its greatest benefits in the north, right? Uh, anyways, uh, let's move through this. There is a lot of different variables. Well, yes, sir? Um, technically, every every unit we cover are on the practice exams. Alrighty. Um, I do remove the 1980 question just because we just say that for in class next year. Alright. All right, friends, let's do it. All right. Remember this chart a little bit like Mr. M's uh, hairline, if you recall. All right. Uh, in the mornings uh, or the afternoons when my hair gets a little crazy. Fortunately, I'm streamlined, so I don't have to worry about that as much anymore. All right. All right. Hey, we ask ourselves. Please remember, industrialization actually had started way back in the early 1800s, right? So in reality, this is almost like industrialization part two, all right? Uh, this is kind of the second half of industrialization, and specifically the industrialization that takes place after the Civil War. All righty. Try to get that air conditioning pumping. Um, so, hey, shh. Uh, what you're going to notice here is uh, what does American society look like in 1875, which, to be honest with you, with you um, is, is very similar, is very uh, early in the industrialization process during this era. And then once we are fully uh, industrialized, which really doesn't occur all the way until 1920, uh, how have we changed? How, what effects has that had? So it's almost like during Reconstruction, at the end of re I, I'm sorry, during industrialization, at the end of industrialization. All right? Uh, what's happening while we are doing this process after the war? Uh, and then what are the end results of it? Uh, we were still largely rural in 1875. By the end of this process, we have become an urban society. More Americans live in cities than outside. Uh, remember, there are no, there's no electricity, no telephones. Um, of course, electricity, telephone, uh, even telegraph, much more commonplace as well. Uh, so not only uh, are we going to see new, and I would argue more modern and better improvements like electricity, uh, but they become more widespread. All right. Remember, uh, in early industrialization, it's mostly Germans, Irish, and English that are coming. During the second half, during this stage of industrialization, right after uh, the Civil War, those people are going to be replaced by Southern and Eastern European immigrants, right? This is more scary to a lot of Americans because, remember, uh, these folks speak new and foreign languages. They're almost exclusively Catholic and or Jewish or Orthodox Christian, which obviously seems very different to the Protestants who dominated here. Um, and uh, railroads did dominate industry. Remember, the first industry to be dominated um, by corporations and to really um, become wealthy, uh, wealthier than everybody else, was railroads, Vanderbilt. like led by Vanderbilt, right? Um, but ultimately, please remember, by the end of this industrialization period, it's actually banks and finance that have become the most important, the most valuable. We are, yes. All righty. Just a little, just a little positive reinforcement about JFK and the space race, right? Yeah, there we go. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what's going on. All right. Um, hey, time out. Let me pause this. I don't want to put uh, time out. All right. All right. All right. All right. Shh. During uh, the early stages of post-Civil War industrial... Can we listen up, please? <laughs> During the post-Civil War industrialization, unions begin to form. By the end of this era, we have large-scale unionism. Uh, they have growing political influence more than they had had before. Hey, remember, uh, before uh, the... As this era is starting, there's really no entertainment in this country, uh, especially in the cities. Uh, after uh, this era, we've got, you know, sports, we've got movies, we've got radio, um, all of these new sources of entertainment that didn't exist before. Hey, we did not really have sub suburbs. Most people lived in city center areas. By the end of this era, we're going to have middle and upper class Americans living increasingly in suburbs outside of the cities or towards the outer limits. 
who can then commute through trolley or streetcar back into the city center. Uh, remember, uh, nearly all educated professionals in this country were WASPs, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants at the start of this industrial process. Uh, we have much more diversity, particularly with women and people of color <coughs> by the end. Uh, remember, the ideas of laissez-faire economics dominated um, in 1870s. Uh, that was, remember, that the government should not regulate business of anything. It should only assist businesses, make it easier for them to make money. Um, obviously, at the end of this era, we're going to have progressivism, uh, where governments are going to be more involved in regulation than ever before. Obviously, women do not vote during most of this era. However, by the end of it, right, women's suffrage achieved. Uh, and we do have some periods of great unrest. 1877, we're going to have the Great Railroad Strike. 1886, uh, we're going to have a series of industrial strikes. And then 1919, we also have that post-World War I Red Scare and uh, strikes and violence as well. So even though it's good times for most Americans economically, we still have a great deal of strife, of protest, of conflict uh, during some certainly tough, specific years. All right, let's get to the details, please. We start with industrialization. Remember, we grow like no economy grows during this era, so that by 1890 we have surpassed Britain, we have surpassed France, we have become, and Germany, we have become the most powerful economy in the world. Um, and if you remember, after the Civil War, it's roads, it's railroads, it's oil, it's steel, it's electricity uh, that become the basis for this growth. If you remember before the Civil War, it was trick, right? Textiles, railroads, iron, and coal. Uh, after the Civil War, it's rose, railroads, oil, steel, electric. All right? Uh, the railroad industry is the key. It stimulates all these other industries and causes them to experience this incredible growth. Uh, remember, why does the railroad industry, what other industries does it benefit? Steel. Uh, we need steel railroads, right? Uh, we need steel tracks as well. Uh, so steel gets a boost when railroads become important. Coal. Why? Because, of course, we're using coal to burn it. Uh, in order, obviously, to fuel our railroad engines. Oil as well. Uh, obviously, if you have any sort of uh, moving vehicle with moving parts, you need oil as a lubricant um, and a potential fuel source. And finance as well. Hey, when railroads are built, uh, many of them are publicly traded, uh, and that is going to encourage banks and finance companies uh, to give out more and more loans, not only to railroad companies, but to other new industries as well that benefit. The Transcontinental Railroad is the key. The first one completed in 1869, thanks to the Pacific Railway Act. Remember, it was a merger of the Central and Union Pacifics. Uh, one came from the East, one came from the West, if you remember. Uh, the Union Pacific came east to west. They were the ones that used the Irish workers, the patties. All right. Uh, west to east was the Central Pacific, right? Leland Stanford. Um, and that, of course, yes, using those Chinese workers nicknamed coolies. All righty. Uh, so coolies and patties. All right. Uh, please remember Cornelius Vanderbilt is considered kind of the giant of the railroad industry. He is the first, if you remember. Uh, to, uh, to, to monopolize steel railroad tracks. Uh, remember, ultimately, he comes to dominate the eastern half of the United States railroad track. So if you wanted to use his rail lines, you had to pay him. And over time, he's able to control more and more of the traffic across the entire eastern United States. He's really our first monopolist, all right? Um, then you start to get into the trust builders, all right? The monopoly builders who follow. John Rockefeller, Standard Oil, remember, um, horizontal integration, where you buy out your rivals, you make them a part of your company uh, to eliminate any competition and control the market that way, right? Uh, then you have Carnegie, right? Remember, he makes his money in steel, um, and uh, he's the vertical integration guy, remember? You control every part of the production process, right? So you do not have to pay middlemen. Uh, you do not have to spend extra costs, for instance, paying the railroad to transport your product. If you own the railroad, and you own the iron ore, and you own the facility to produce it, you don't have to pay anybody because you own them all yourself, right? Um, J.P. Morgan, interlocking directorates. Morgan, a banker, right, a financier. Uh, remember, what he does is he creates holding companies, uh, and then he puts loyal people on the boards of the directors of the holding companies. The holding companies buy out other businesses. Ultimately, that board of directors 
reports back to him. Uh, he kind of makes the decisions that the board uh, implements, um, even though he's not technically sitting on the board himself. It's a way for him to have a tremendous control over a bunch of va vastly different companies by controlling the holding company that technically owns all of them. All right? Um, so, hey, if the government comes to him and says, hey, you got a monopoly, you control all these companies, right? Technically, he wasn't the owner the holding company was, and he just influenced or controlled the decisions the holding company made. All right? What decisions did the company make? Usually uh, to do business with his other businesses. All righty? So, obviously, he benefits in that way. Uh, also, Philip Armour in meat. That's why we have, like, uh, if anybody's familiar with, like, Armour hot dogs today, uh, ballpark pranks, if you know what those are. Um, those are uh, produced by Armour, the company that originally developed a monopoly on meat packing, which I would argue is one of the worst words in the English language, all right? Uh, meat packing. We can put that alongside moist, right? I think that's a weird word, too. All right. Anyways, Duke. Uh, the Dukes own... Uh, American Tobacco, hey, uh, in case anybody was wondering, Duke University, yes, it's named after that family. All righty, so, um, yeah, you know. Uh, Gospel of Wealth, Andrew Carnegie, shh. Uh, remember, we have these different philosophies that emerged during this era. Gospel of Wealth is uh, that wealthy people need to give back to their community. They've gotten rich thanks to their communities. They need to give back. Not directly, because remember, these folks are allowed to fair. They don't believe in direct handouts or assistance. Uh, instead, you build what they call projects for the public good. Universities, hospitals, libraries, schools, um, like our very own museo over there. All righty. Uh, which was built with a luxurious $10,000 grant from the Carnegie Foundation, uh, which makes me laugh uh, because today we'd need a couple million dollars. All righty. So, um, anyways, what's up? Isn't it awesome? It's kind of awesome. All right. I'm sorry. I think that's kind of cool. Um... You know, while well, we also realize this guy's kind of an a-hole. All righty, right? He's like, hey, hey, starving man on the street. All right, let's build a library behind you. All right, so, uh, you know. <laughs> yes, right? Hey, go eat page 12. All right, yes. Um, anyway, well, I mean, you know. Um, I will tell you one thing. These, these gifts um, obviously are still being used today, so uh, while it may seem a little bit heartless, obviously the benefits of these, uh, of these, of these initiatives uh, last well into the future. Hey, now we get into uh, ones that are deemed, I think, less friendly, less tolerant. Um, social Darwinism, remember, is another major issue that emerges during this time. It was based on, obviously, evolution, which was starting to become a, uh, a more well-known theory, thanks to Charles Darwin. Um, and again, what did it argue? It argued that uh, survival of the fittest should apply to society as well, um, that individuals who achieve wealth and power and greatness were superior in some ways, uh, maybe mentally superior, maybe ethically or morally superior. I don't know about that. Um, but uh, that uh, if others wanted to achieve the wealth that they had, remember, they needed to almost emulate or copy these people. It was popular with WASP, it was popular with nativists as a way to maybe convince immigrants uh, to be more American and to behave more along the American traditional style. All right. Again, you'll notice Charles Graham Sumner, Russell Cornwell, Conwell, I should say, they are uh, both ministers, Protestant faith uh, at the time. Uh, remember the self-made man notion, right? That rags to riches, which was the popular stories of the time, that you could rise from nothing and achieve greatness if, based on hard work and your own abilities. Um, we know that's not necessarily 100% true, right? Obviously, there's a lot of factors that come into success, and some, obviously, that are outside of your control. All right? Um, Horatio Alger was the guy that wrote all those children's stories, the rags to riches books. Again, they kind of were the same book over and over with a different theme, all right? Um, come start with nothing, end up with amazingness. Uh, basically, emulate the story of Carnegie, and you too can become great, all right? Government, remember, government really regulated, um, did, did a bad job of regulating businesses during this time. Um, remember, with the Wabash case, it overturned Mun v. Illinois, the Granger Laws. Uh, and what it said was that states can't regulate interstate commerce, only the feds could. Uh, so the federal government basically protected railroads, right, from state regulation, right? 
Uh, Interstate Commerce Act, remember, it was our first act that actually regulated railroads, tried to eliminate some of those rebates and pools and, and special things that they were providing to the media and politicians. Uh, remember, it was intentionally made weak with no enforcement so that it was technically a law, but it was never actively enforced against railroad companies. All right. Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890. Uh, remember, it's our first congressional act that actually uh, agreed to break up uh, monopolies. Again, it was too vague, it was too weak, so it was rarely used, and actually, in a really horrific irony, it was actually sometimes used by the government. Even though it was a law that was designed to break up trust, monopolies, it was sometimes used to actually break up unions instead, uh, because the exact wording of the, of the law said, any uh, cooperation that results in restrained trade ought to be broken up by the government. That was supposed to be vaguely meaning monopolies, but based on the exact wording, uh, it was actually used to break up labor unions instead. All right, so perfect example of how government during this era not only favored or protected business, uh, but actively worked against groups like unions that might reduce business profits. All right. Um, urbanization is another impact of the revolution of the Industrial Rev. A massive, massive movement to the cities. All right. First, you've got the new immigrants that are going to be moving to the cities, right? Southern and Eastern Europeans. Uh, but you're going to have many Americans from rural areas that move to the cities as well to take advantage of new industrial jobs. All right. What are the results of this urbanization? One, we see the growth of political machines. All right. Uh, political machines benefit from all this new immigration coming in. Uh, remember, they provide services or favors to the immigrants in exchange for their political support. All right. Um, and uh, the social gospel uh, movement emerges, right? Uh, which is that religious uh, Protestants uh, want to go into the urban areas and try to improve the social condition of the people living there. Uh, one, as a path towards their own uh, salvation, but two, uh, to try to achieve more good on earth during their own lifetimes. Uh, the settlement house movement, the most famous example of the social gospel, um, sets up in cities in order to provide services to women, to children, and other immigrants in overcrowded uh, conditions uh, in many American cities. Nativism reemerges, if you remember, during this era, um, because many uh, nativists dislike immigrants, uh, and uh, they uh, obviously they they oppose political machines, they oppose. Um, obviously, uh, the consumption of alcohol, because they associate that with immigrant behavior. Um, businesses, obviously, did welcome immigrants. They wanted as many immigrants as possible, because that gave them a steady, constant supply of cheap labor. All right? Um, there was a lot of corruption in government during the Gilded Age. Uh, look, it's an era where business dominates and corrupts and influences government in ways uh, that even were new and radical for the U.S., all right? Uh, we have machines, right, in most American cities that just controlled political decisions in those places, all right? Uh, the most famous, of course, as always, is uh, Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall in New York City, but they existed all over, all right? President Grant was had a very kind of corrupt presidency, even though he wasn't so corrupt, the people underneath him were, all right? So... It's an era where business is able to really manipulate politics um, and buy out politicians for their own needs. All right, social Darwinism, already mentioned, gospel of wealth, social gospel. Other examples of the social gospel movement besides settlement houses, uh, the American Red Cross, all right, uh, forms during this time to provide basic medical care to immigrants in cities. It was formed by the famous nurse Clara Barton, of course, settlement house, uh, formed, founded by Jane Addams, right? Um, and then the Salvation Army, right, which provides a wide number of services. Their first was actually soup kitchens, uh, where they provided food uh, to those in need. All right. Uh, the rise of unions. Uh, we're going to start to see the emergence of unions. It's in a different part in the notes um, in much greater detail. Uh, so I will just jump over that for now. Uh, down to Gilded Age politics here. All right. Questions? Yeah. Can we, can we have um, social Newtonianism? Every, um, every movement has an opposite movement. You know how, like, every time the immigration goes up, so does Newtonianism? Yep. I'm going to coin that. <laughs> what, what is the term? Social Newtonianism. Newtonianism. Oh, okay. I get what you're saying there. Yeah. 
Like for essentially, uh, for every social action, there is an equal and or opposite social reaction. All right, I like it. All right. Um, I guess, I guess, I would. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's interesting because here now, right, the apple hasn't fallen off the tree, right? Oh, wow. Right? Uh, the tree is just providing the theories on her own. All right, so, anyways, all right, that was a little Newtonian humor there. Tough crowd. All righty. Uh, um, all right, sorry to bring you all down there with that Newtonian humor. Gravity. All right. Um, all right. Anyways, Gilded Age politics, all right? Um, anyways, uh, we already know what the compromise is, and uh, we know that that really typifies this era, where deals are made by parties, right, uh, that oftentimes maybe did not do reflect uh, or benefit a majority of Americans. Corruption, I already mentioned, in Grant's presidency, um, the whiskey ring, they're selling illegal whiskey, uh, liquor licenses to people, and then they're pocketing the money. Uh, remember, uh, a couple of his, of his cabinet tried to corner the gold market, which meant control it so they could manipulate the prices. Um, the Secretary of War is, is taking money and putting it in his own pocket <laughs> from the Treasury. Anyways, so you don't need to know the specifics of Grant's corruption, uh, but the point is, this is a very corrupt time politically. All right? Um, we do start to see reformers start to emerge. Remember, the very first reformers in this era were called mugwumps. Um, the most famous reformer, interestingly enough, wasn't really a politician. It was Thomas Nash, the cartoonist, all right? Uh, that's why, if you remember, his cartoons so often attach things like uh, political machines, right? Um, and the spoil system, even, uh, because uh, he is one of these early reformers that believe corruption has gotten out of control with the government. Uh, remember, during... Um, this era, the two parties pretty much agreed on most things, all right? There was very little disagreement between the two parties. Um, the only issues that really separated them, if you remember, was the money issue. Should we print paper money or no, more or less, try to cause inflation or not, all right? Um, and the tariff issue, should we raise or lower the tariff, all right? Well, obviously, we know how the tariff works. Northerners tended to support higher tariffs, right, which meant Republicans did. Democrats obviously opposed them since they were more clustered in the South. All right. Uh, we do have a couple of panics, 1873, 1893. So again, we follow that 20-year pattern even during this period of growth. Uh, uh, culture during this era. Uh, remember, we're going to place the romanticism that existed before the war with what is called realism. All right. Uh, depicts, uh, depicts life in the United States in a more accurate way um, than had been done so previously. Uh, it is partly the Ashcan School. Very good. Good memory there. Yep, that is the Ashcan School, uh, the realists. Um, and again, Stephen Crane, Mark Twain. We've all read some Twain. Have we read Stephen Crane? Anybody read The Red Badge of Courage? No? Nobody, you can, have we had never read uh, Blue, what is it called, Blue Hotel? Oh, that is a trip, people. Oh, I really, darn it, I need to talk to Ms. Gonzalez about that. <laughs> All righty. Uh, oh, no, 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 I mean for next year. It's a, okay, okay. It's, a, it's a short story. What is it? It's a short story. Yeah. Uh, because I don't take every page. It's about people who show up in a, in a, in a really kind of <laughs> hotel that where weird things are happening on a night, on a really dark, stormy night. Um, no. <laughs> What's up? Kind of like that, yeah. It's kind of like a hotel. What's up? Yeah, go for it. Um, you can just go to this one. Yeah, alrighty. Um, and leave it open, okay? Or leave it unlocked. <coughs> okay. Culture. Realism is the predominant um, cultural view during this time. Critics of this industrial society, at least the critics before 1900, then later on we'll look at the critics after 1900. Henry George, remember, uh, he uh, criticizes our tax system. He says the wealthy people ought to be taxed at a hundred percent rate, all right? Um, and uh, that money should essentially uh, be uh, redistributed to other groups. By the way, 
it was not 100% across the board, all right? He said in certain areas of their investments, they should be taxed at about 100%, which is, of course, hey, it's absurd, all right? It's designed to be intentionally kind of hyperbolistic, uh, to basically uh, appeal to the masses. Um, and he basically argued those funds should be spent on social programs uh, to better kind of provide wealth to more groups. Or do you think he was kind of using the, like, the door in the face technique where he has this outrageous plan and then they try to like compromise and it's only like 30 I think that's exactly what it is. All right, I think that's exactly what it is. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like what our school district did with our with the teachers union. It was kind of well played by them. All right. Um, they said that we, when we were negotiating, when we were bargaining, um, they said we're in real bad economic situation right now, which we're not in a great one. Um, and so um, all of us had to take big pay cuts um, and other things as well. Um, and uh, ultimately, I said to people, oh, they did that for the exact same reason. So then ultimately, we're going to settle back at zero, right? Because we wanted to raise, they wanted to cut. Um, and ultimately, I think that was their tactic um, to basically say, hey, how about we just keep the status quo? How about we just keep it as it is right now? Um, and then they can come back to us and say, hey, look what we did, right? We, we, we met you in the middle. We did you guys a favor um, by, uh, by not cutting your wages or things like that. All right. Yeah. They pulled a little, yeah, a little bait and switch. Um, but hey, that's just, if you ask me, good negotiating. You know, and also, unfortunately, um, there's probably going to be some teacher layoffs as well. Um, so that's unfortunate. All right. But uh, fortunately, it's not as bad as it seemed like it would be uh, a few weeks ago or a month ago or so. Uh, so I think most of these teachers are probably going to be coming back, which I hope they will. Yeah. Do you know if Donna needs you um, I don't know if she's retiring. Um, they had to uh, they had to let people know by um, last week. Um, but obviously, I consider that to be kind of a personal thing. So I don't really go in like, "Hey, you're retiring." You know what I mean? Um, it's more along the lines of when I find out they are. I'm just like, "Oh my God, I wish I were you." Uh, because I mean, doesn't retirement sound awesome? But anyways, all right. Henry Demarest Floyd, paying attention, please, Kevin. Wealth against Commonwealth, criticizes Standard Oil. Not going to be the last, but he is pretty much the first. Um, criticized Rockefeller, his tactics, his methods uh, for achieving all of this wealth. Thorsten Veblen, theory of the leisure class, attacked those nouveau riche or nouveau rich, um, which, um, uh, which uh, obviously were the folks who had just acquired their money recently, uh, and they were kind of living extravagant, flaunting their wealth in the face of most other Americans. How the other half lives, remember, uh, Jacob Rees, the photojournalist, takes all those pictures of the slums um, in New York City to show the rest of the country how bad urban life is for many Americans. Many of the, yeah. What's that? Does he start, is this the start of the Hooverville stuff? No. Um, the Hooverville stuff is unique to the New Deal, all righty. But, hey, I never really thought about it. But you could kind of do a synthesis with that, all right? You could do a synthesis point between Reese uh, during the uh, during this era, uh, the industrial era, the Gilded Age, um, and uh, and kind of with uh, Dorothea Lang and other photojournalists who chronicled what was happening before and during the uh, Depression. All right, there he is talking again. I don't know why. Um, anyways, journalism. All right, yellow journalism uh, becomes popular, but. Uh, remember, when it comes to industrial era, we're talking about muckraking, um, and uh, of course that uh, is where your, the journalists kind of do investigative work, uh, in-depth exposés and investigations uh, on wealthy corporations or problems occurring in society. All right, uh, pragmatism, not more anymore on it. Well, social Darwinism got all those. Remember, we see a reemergence of kind of conservative social rules during this era as well. It's called new morality. You're supposed to kind of behave in a more conservative way, no sexuality. Remember the Comstock laws banned any mention of sexuality, birth control, um, very strict censorship, for instance, on, um, on what was published. I remember it was like fully clothed women, uh, even like arms and ankles and things like that were considered kind of like, woo, all righty. Uh, I can't believe they're showing that, all right. Um, and uh, unionization, Shh. Unionization, we're gonna also start to see, obviously, as many workers uh, struggle more, 
um, in these tough industrialist times. Uh, we're going to start to see unions form and grow larger because people are hoping unions will be better be able to protect and help them in the workplace. All right. Um, and uh, again, uh, the Civil War had created a shortage of workers. Uh, there's increased demand for workers after the war. Uh, and so we start to see unions start to grow uh, as time goes by. Um, however, remember, despite their efforts in forming during this era, is that me? <laughs> Despite their efforts um, in uh, informing, they're really going to be unsuccessful during this era, all right? Because business and government are going to work together to crush these labor unions, okay? Uh, the National Labor Union is the first union, uh, national union in this country. Um, it's also going to be the first to die out, right, because of the Panic of 1873. Uh, businesses are able to convince the public it was the union's fault that the panic occurred, uh, and so support for the union falls apart. All right. Then the next major incident involving unions is the Great Railroad Strike. Uh, that is the first major strike uh, na in American history, the first national strike. Uh, obviously, it involved railroad workers, um, and uh, ultimately, it is the first time that a president ever used federal troops to break up a strike. Remember, he argued. Government business is being interrupted by this strike. We're not able to deliver the mail, for instance. Uh, and so he used that as justification to send troops in to forcefully end the railroad strike and put those people back to work. All right? Uh, the Knights of Labor uh, is your second major union from this era. Um, and uh, again, they're formed by Terrence Powderly. Remember, they were one big union for both skilled and unskilled. That was a problem. All right? Please remember. Uh, they were brought down partly because of the Haymarket Square bombing. Uh, remember, they have a series of Labor Day strikes. Um, and uh, when the police go in to try to break up the Labor Day strikes in Chicago, anarchists start throwing homemade explosives at them. Police are killed. Uh, it becomes known as the Haymarket Square bombing. Um, because the Knights had organized the strike, the protest, um, they are blamed for it. It's one of the reasons why they lose kind of credibility inside the United States. They're viewed as radical. All right. Um, the irony of it all is um, they really weren't responsible for what happens there. Uh, but anyways, uh, remember, they want not just workplace reforms. They want better housing, right, better political rights, better rights for education for kids. So they're not just focusing on workplace issues. That's another problem. All right. Uh, they do not focus on the bread and butter stuff, right? The easy workplace, oh my gosh, uh, the easy workplace issues that exist, all right? Um, ultimately, uh, remember the biggest issue with the Knights, uh, besides the Haymarket Square bombing, is that skilled workers will not go on strike to support their unskilled workers. Um, they don't think it's worth it enough to support the unskilled guys. Yeah. Just Yes, I mean, to be honest with you, that is still used today, all right? That's still a common uh, technique uh, when there is a strike to use temporary workers. But yes, this is the period when we start to see that emerge for the first time, all right? Because you always have such a ready supply of immigrants during this era, you could hire them as replacement or temporary workers instead, all right? Uh, the most famous of the three labor unions, please remember, is the AFL. Uh, the AFL, skilled workers uh, only. Uh, they were very capitalist. They were pro-capitalist. They did not want to be labeled like the Knights as socialist or radical, so they did major efforts to try to prove their loyalty to the government. They do focus on bread and butter, eight-hour work days, right? Uh, short, uh, better wages, um, improved working conditions, and because their focus is more narrow, they're better able to achieve these gains, all right? Also, because it's made up just of skilled workers, uh, there's more kind of unity and loyalty amongst the members, all right? Remember their very famous saying, Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Um, very similar to our motto, right? Uh, six hours for rest, uh, six, hour, uh, six hours for work, six hours for rest, um, and uh, 12 hours for a push studying. All righty. Uh, uh, huh? I know, right? Yeah. All right, that's fine. All right, yeah. yeah. That's cool. All right, yeah, I'm down with that. Um, anyways, a uh, couple of other big strikes you need to remember. What? Yes, it is. The AFL still exists today. Shh. It is actually um, the largest union in this country today. Uh, it's going to merge with an unskilled union during the Depression called the CIO. 
Uh, so the AFL CIO still around today, uh, largest uh, union, and this is the this is the the foundation piece. This is where it all begins. All right, uh, Homestead strike. Uh, remember, uh, is another second major strike during this era. Uh, it is when uh, Carnegie Steel right gets uh, the workers uh, go on strike there. Remember, a series of battles are fought, right, between uh, security guys, they're called Pinkertons, um, and, uh, and, the, and the strikers. Uh, eventually, uh, state troops are called in, federal troops are called in, uh, and the strike is put down. All right? Uh, you may recall, all of these workers were fired um, and never got their jobs back. All right? Uh, and then the Pullman strike is a railroad strike. Remember, the Pullman car company would have made luxurious railroad cars. Um, again... Holy moly, I don't get three calls in a day, people. Yes, that right. is it. Speaker. Hello? 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, anyways, we're going to continue to see uh, activity related to unions as we get into the 1900s, the Progressive Era. Now, hey, you'll notice that this unit ends in 1898, uh, and the next unit, progressivism, picks up from there. So this, era, this information all here is actually duplicated uh, in a later page of the notes as well, which gives us the opportunity to jump over it. All righty, so go to page 77. <laughs> and remember, you got your three big unions, you got your three big strikes. Please remember... Failure, 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 failure. All righty. Not real successful at the time, but their greatest success is going to be achieved uh, in the uh, eras to come. Right. <laughs> hey, immigration again. See if there's anything we need to hit on again. Uh, we become a, uh, we change from a rural to an urban society. Uh, why large numbers of, of industrial jobs? Uh, in American cities, on top of that, new white-collar jobs emerge, right? Uh, especially for women, clerks, typists, telephone operators, uh, front desk people. Department stores are going to emerge during this era, right? That's good for consumers. It's bad for small businesses that can't compete with the Sears and the Robux uh, of the world. Um, ironically enough, now Sears is about to go out of business today. Uh, because they cannot com compete with the Walmarts and the Targets of the world, and more importantly, the Amazons of the world. All right, so isn't it, isn't it interesting how they were the ones that forced mom and pop businesses out of, uh, out of business oftentimes in the early 1900s, and now as our economy evolves, they are the next ones that are obsolete. They are uh, desperately trying to stay in business. What's up? Um, I mean, I, in, I, I would argue that there's always that trend and pattern that occurs, um, but I, I don't know where we would be going next, right? Um, I don't know. Is anybody familiar with this uh, online retailer um, that is actually, I guess, larger than Amazon, and it's really popular in China and throughout Asia? It's called Alibaba. Uh, anybody familiar with Alibaba? Yeah, it's basically, hey, it's, ba it's basically like Chinese, China's Amazon. Um, and they actually, because of the population of China um, and much of Southeast Asia, actually are doing more business. All right. Not just that, what they pay over there? They scan QR codes. Like uh, they have like QR codes like on their desks, and you scan it, and that's how you pay. There's like no receipt or anything. It's really weird. <laughs> what is over there? <laughs> <laughs> like, have you been to Asia? I don't even know that. You know, sorry, I a lot of Asia's history. Asia's kind of big. All right. So, uh, because one person is using QR codes, probably doesn't mean all of Asia. Oh, by the way, oh, by the way, where seventy percent of the population uh, is in less developed areas. We don't have to worry about the less developed. Hello. Social Darwinism. Hey, hey, you somebody somebody calling me? Stop calling me. 
All righty. I'm being yelled at for picking up my dry cleaning. All righty. Uh, I don't have any dry cleaning out. All right. Uh, it's an angry Asian person. You need to pick up your dry cleaning. All right. So Wait, why are you sending people here? No. no. Hey, it's pr it's a prank thing where you can prank people and send like recorded messages to them. <gasps> really? Yeah. My geography kids did it to me. My geography kids did it to me earlier in the year. Uh, it was like uh, an old African American woman, um, and she's like, hey. Why do you keep freaking calling me? I'm sick and tired of you calling me. And I'm like, I, I didn't call you. I don't, wait, wait, I don't know. Do you know the name of the app? No, no. And I'm like, I don't know who, I don't know who this is. And she's like, I told you. All right. And I'm like, ah, ah. hang up. She calls me back. And I'm like, oh, hang on. It's like a number in Pennsylvania. You know what I mean? I'm like, I live in California. All right. You know. Um, yeah, so anyway, somebody's doing that in the room. Maxine agrees, all right? Uh, look, she's, she's, she knows what's going on here. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Urbanization. All right. Uh, anyways, hey, new immigration contributes to uh, this urbanization. I already mentioned that. Uh, you're going to uh, see uh, the development of skyscrapers, right, um, and new infrastructure like Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, really, this changes society in so many ways. We see all of this focus now on the cities as compared to a previous rural society. I'm seeing a lot of duplication here. Oh, uh, duplication, 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 duplication. Uh, those are some of the names associated with the social gospel. Duplication, duplication. Duplication. <laughs> Do I have to stop this car? All right. Um, anyways. Good one, good one. All right, all right, somebody lock that door. Um, all right. Hey, nativism returns. I mentioned during the industrial era, specific examples of that. Uh, the American Protective Association, anti-Catholic, worked against Catholic candidates, right, to try to prevent Catholics from being voted into political office. Chinese Exclusion Act, 1882, we know what it is. It's a very uh, massive anti-immigration law. Eliminates Chinese immigration, motivated really by California. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's uh, the first major restriction on immigration into the U.S., um, obviously, we're going to see other examples of nativism as we get into the 1920s, but we're not there yet. Okay? What's up? We are not there yet. No. Um, and um, let's see here. Do I want to finish up the New South today? Yes, I think you do. The New South. Remember, after the after Reconstruction, and really after the Civil War, uh, Southerners, some Southerners advocate. Listen up! Stop talking. Some Southerners have advocated um, that the South needs to reinvent itself and reindustrialize. It was led by a guy named Henry Grady. Uh, he basically said, "Hey, if we're ever going to be the equal of the North, we got to industrialize. We got to become like them." All right, ladies. Thank you. Um, this is a problem for Southerners because uh, they are so far behind in industrialization and they're a rural agricultural society. But his basic argument is, hey, we have to become the North. We have to industrialize uh, if we're ever going to compete with them. Um, and uh, we do start to see the emergence of some industries in the South. For instance, some textiles relocate to the Southern states. We start to see some coal mining. Tobacco becomes a major industry. Um, iron and steel slowly will increase in the South, yes. So I think it would be considered like industrialization of the South. It would. I, I, it's considered to be the first example, really, of industrialization in the South. Um, but I do want to remind everybody when we get down to results, uh, ultimately they're still pretty much overwhelmingly an agricultural society. Yeah. Uh, it does increase child labor as well. Yes, as we move industries into the South, uh, we're going to see uh, child labor increase, not just now in the northern states, right, but we're going to see it in the south, um, especially in those southern states, actually. Uh, we also start to see railroads get built um, in the south, although, again, most are still owned and operated by northern companies, and most railroads were still located in the northern states. 
Uh, the cotton industry develops. Remember, uh, we start to see more cotton mills. We start to see larger and larger cotton plantations. Um, that being said, workers in the South were paid significantly less, uh, which is one of the reasons why many businesses relocated there to take advantage of lower wages for workers. All right. Uh, results, southern manufacturing grows, but it's still only 10% of the overall nation's total. Um, income in the south goes up, but it's still significantly lower than in the north. Uh, sharecropping still dominates the southern system. Most Amer southerners are still farmers, usually small farmers. Um, and uh, the south still largely dependent on the north, even after this. So, hey, it's... It, while it's a good idea, it really never is implemented, uh, and the news and the South still really remains agricultural in too much of the 1900s. All right, politics of the South, again, a lot of repeat and duplication. Uh, right, uh, Reconstruction, we already mentioned, we know what the Solid South is that emerges after the Civil War. Redeemers, remember, are the white Southerners that take back the governments in the South. We know disenfranchisement, and again, we know that after the failed Civil Rights Act of 75, North gives up on those attempts for some time. Remember Plessy, the case that allowed for uh, segregation, uh, and let's remember the rise of the Populist Party, which really begins in the 1890s. Uh, and of course, we see the development of lynching yet again. Um, and the, and the growth of lynching uh, across the South because it sends powerful race relations uh, messages to blacks. All right, I think we'll stop there. Um, now, hey, please understand that does not technically take us all the way through Unit 6, right? Uh, but we just got a few pages to finish up on, and I think I've decided that about 10 pages of, this, of the notes of the review guide